Do please be seated, and as you sit down, if you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Judges, uh, those of us for whom College Church is their home will know it's our custom to go through uh, parts of the Bible uh, consecutively, and we've come to Judges chapter 4, and it's uh, a story, the book of Judges, and as, as stories go, you need to hear the story and feel its passion and context, so we're going to read out this part of the story uh, right the way from chapter 4, verse 1, to the, actually the end of chapter 5. Now let's pray as we come now to God's Word. Father, we've already sung a prayer, and we now say the same thing without musical accompaniment. Speak, O Lord, restore us, not just for our sake, but for the good of society and the world, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, uh, the book of Judges, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, it is an amazing story. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, <clears throat> who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh, and Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Habab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zananim, which is near Kedesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the, peop all the men were, who were with him from Harasheth Hagayim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagayim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with the rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. 
And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. That the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offer themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villages ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, when war was in the gates, was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offer themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way, to the sound of musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villages in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in a song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then down march the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord march down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their roots, they march down into the valley. Following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Machir, march down the commanders. And from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah and Issachar, faithful to Barak. Into the valley, they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the whistlings for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landing. Zebulun is a people who risk their lives the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on, my soul, with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Mezoz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Of tent-dwelling women, most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg, and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. But your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. If I had to pick one passage in the Bible not to preach, 
this would be it. <laughs> not only is it long, not only is it filled with the complexities of ancient Hebrew poetry and the challenge that is to communicate in anything like a contemporary idiom, it also has at its heart two of the great challenges that critics of Orthodox Christianity these days constantly raise. Ever since, I suppose, the extension of the voting rights of women at the beginning of the last century and then, of course, the, the feminist movement in the 1960s, the charge has been leveled against Orthodox Christianity that it is essentially anti-women, misogynist, patriarchal. And for those who wish to adjust the standards of the traditional Christian position on the roles of men and women in church, Deborah is a sort of champion. Or, for the others, she's the exception that proves the general rule. And then, of course, well, ever since, I suppose, 9-11, when those planes were flown into the Twin Towers in New York City by religious extremists, the charge has been leveled against any kind of passionate religion, any kind of committed faith that is all the same. The critics of Orthodox Christianity feel that to hold on to Christian faith with an Orthodox passionate commitment is inevitably dangerous, even violent. And here we have this story, and when you read it, you think, well, who can blame them for thinking that? Well, friends, we have to face up to these things. There's no point living in cloud cuckoo pious land and pretending people don't think those things about Christian faith. We have to think about it together. Do they have a point or not? We can't hide away from parts of the Bible like this. What does it mean? And while this story, when rightly understood with a biblical theology and pointing to the feet of Jesus who tells us to love our enemies, does not, this story does not answer all of those questions, it does shed light upon them. And so when I read this story, I hear the critic of Christianity saying, what about the Crusades? What about violence? And someone else saying, what about the record of how the church has treated women? And I want us to see how this passage actually points us to the loving Lord Jesus. Here we have God's two controversies. One is Deborah. And I suppose if we had to characterize this controversy, we might call it the controversy of women first. Uh, Deborah, as uh, verse uh, 4 of, uh, uh, of uh, chapter 4 makes clear, is rather a unique figure in the Bible. She's a prophetess, well, there are other female prophetesses, but she was also judging Israel at that time. There are 12 judges in the book of Judges, and she's the only female judge. Deborah occupied an official leadership position over God's people. There are many other great and godly women recorded in the Bible, of course. We might think of Esther, Esther who saved God's people. But Esther was a queen of Persia, not of Israel, uh, Persia being modern Iran. 
Or we might think of uh, the, the simple servant girl, girl of, of Naaman, the Syrian, who encouraged him to seek healing from his leprosy uh, through the, the prophet Elisha. Or we might think of the prophetess Miriam, the sister of Moses, or a less well-known prophetess in the Old Testament, Huldah. Or Anna in the New Testament, who is a prophetess who points to the baby Jesus as, it's, as he's brought into the temple and, 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 sh- and declares that he's the Messiah. Or we might think of Ruth, another great female hero in the Bible, who also, like Esther, has a book named after her. But not only that, she's so significant in the Bible that in Matthew's genealogy, uh, the, the, the ancestry of Jesus, Ruth takes a prominent place in the genealogy of the Messiah. Not to mention how Jesus himself, in his sovereign plan, after his resurrection, appears first of all, to women. And at a time when uh, women's testimony was legally dismissed as invalid, it's a radical move on the part of Jesus. Uh, Such a, a radical and affirming approach to women is confirmed by the Apostle Paul, who teaches that in Christ uh, there is no male nor female. We are all one, equal. But in other ways, Deborah, with her official leadership position over God's people, is rather unique, though, for there's another side of the coin. In the New Testament, all of Jesus' disciples, all the apostles, are, of course, men. And while in the New Testament there is record of one female deacon... Phoebe, there's no record of any female elder. And in that other deeply controversial passage, which thankfully this morning I don't have time to get into as well, uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy uh, limits the teaching authority of women uh, over, over men. In the church, that passage, 1 Timothy 2-3, to is all about how God's people are to operate in the local church, the pillar and the household of God. He's not talking about businesses or politics, he's talking about the church. But nonetheless, he does, he does write that. There were prophetesses in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that. Paul clearly expects that women will pray and prophesy publicly, which must mean they had some sort of exhorting or teaching role of some kind. That Deborah... Uh, is uh, rather unique, is affirmed by her own interaction with Barak. It is quite extraordinary. Uh, If you look down with me at your Bible, see uh, chapter 4 and verses 6 to 9, you see how it goes. Uh, She calls Barak to him. He's he's the guy who's meant to lead the army and tells him to get on with it, you know, go, God's with you, but then he refuses to go unless unless she goes with him, verse eight, uh, verse eight. and then, he, then she says, well, I will go, but uh, you won't get any of the glory, for God will sell scissor into the hand of a woman, which, by the way, is not Deborah. That's, of course, Jael, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, she's aware that her role is a little uh, unique, and uh, she encourages the men to do what they were meant to be doing. You see the same in uh, her song, chapter 5, verse 3. She talks about, I will sing, I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, but then she says, and nothing happened until, verse 7, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. You, you see the picture. We, we've characterized this generation in previous weeks, the generation who grew up, who knew no, neither God nor what he'd done. We perhaps a little unfairly characterized them as generation flaky, you may remember. Well, here the men of this generation were frankly wimps. 
and, and, and they wouldn't go to war, which of anything in ancient life was meant to be the preserve of men, they wouldn't go to war until a woman held their hands and told them to go, until a mother arose, until mummy told them. That's what she's saying. What, what are we uh, to learn from this? Well, of course, there is a word to men here. If you are a man here this morning, and I know at least some of you are, we are not called as men by the virtue of being Christians. We're not called to be wimps. We saw last week that we, all of us, men and women, are meant to be meek. But as one commentator on this passage put it, though Moses was described as the meekest man on the face of the earth, no one would have called Moses a pushover. Step up to the plate. Do what you're meant to be doing. Lead your families. You've been put on this earth for a purpose, in this church for a purpose. Stand up and be counted. Don't wait and wait and wait until someone will finally go with you holding your hand before you'll do it. Be like a lighthouse, not like a flickering candle that is blown out by every contrary wind. But then, of course, there is a word here for women as well. Women be all that God wants you to be. There are times when a Deborah does need to rise up. It, it, it happened. Uh, but of course, it's not intended to be a rule. Anyone who thinks that the story of Deborah is intended to be a rule to overturn what the Bible teaches about the roles of men and women in church need to consider whether the story of Jael is meant to be a rule telling us to lure our guests into our house and beat their brains out with a rock. We have to interpret the narrative based upon the didactic parts of Scripture. And yes, sometimes a Deborah does rise up. There's a long history of influential and godly and powerful women in, in the church and in the world. Good thing too. I think I've told the church before of my grandmother who, when she was over, she was a very fiery, kind of strong-minded sort of woman who came from the south of Ireland and w was brought to London as a, as a, as a young woman and then grew up her, there and her family and all the rest. When she was over 90 years old, she delighted in driving at over 90 miles an hour. <laughs> she was a strong woman. Nothing wrong with being a strong woman. Don't usurp the role of the men. Encourage them. Well, what should we say about the other controversy? If Deborah is the controversy, these two controversies of God is women first, the other one is JL, and how might we characterize that? I suppose we could characterize it as violence, please. Uh, the story we've read out, but to remind you, you can see it again in, from verse 18 of chapter 4. She gets Sisera to come to her tent. What's particularly unnerving about it is actually Sisera isn't her enemy. Uh, he's a friend of the family. That's why he goes to her tent. And of course, she, she picks up a peg and a hammer and drives it through his head. The, the, the choice of the weapon is so unusual that clearly it was intended to be symbolic. It could be that Sisera is, uh, that, that Jael is using the implements that were intended for women to use, like the Bedouin still today, putting up tents was women's work. So it could be that what's going on is Jael, as it were, like a 
sort of stereotypical 1950s housewife is picking up a kitchen knife or a, a rolling pin and killing the guy. Into the hands of a woman he fell. Or it could be that as the translator uh, brings out in chapter 5 where it talks about the workman's ha hammer, it could be that instead in that stereotypical 1950s housewife world, she's, she's putting down the dishcloth and she's putting up, picking up the workman's pneumatic drill to kill him. Either way, it's, it's a grim caricature. What are we to make of it? And in fact, it gets worse. I hope you picked it up as we were reading it through, but the, the song that Deborah and Barak compose on the eve of their victory is unashamedly singing about uh, the, the bloody defeat of Caesar in particular. And it's intended to, you, you can, it's intended to be rhythmic. You, 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 it, between her feet he sank, he fell. There's a, you can almost see them dancing around the late night fires after their victory, repeating the chorus. Between her feet he sank, he fell. He lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Let's have the chorus one more time. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. <gasps> like, we, you know, that we should ask Pastor Eric Dewar to put that to a song for us. <laughs> But that's what they were doing. What do we make of all this? Well, it's important to notice verse 31. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. It's all his enemies, including at times the Israelites. The book of Judges describes for us over and over again how the Israelites also would fall under God's judgment when they were his enemies. All his enemies. But it's also all your enemies, his enemies, which opens up a more general category that we must understand. Old Testament Israel was a theocracy. That is, the church and the state were one. They were given the sword to exercise God's judgment over wrongdoers, like the police or the army or something like that. Well, we're not Old Testament Israel. We're the New Testament church. We're not a theocracy. The New Testament church does not hold the power of the sword. Paul very clearly teaches about this in the book of Romans. We are the city of God that runs parallel to the secular city. The state bears the sword. It has power of incarceration and capital punishment if the country still allows it. Not the church. God's judgment today on our sin happens as we experience the effects of that sin. And then, of course, ultimately on that day, the one thing we must not say is that God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament and a God of love in the New. Just need to read your Bibles more. God, when He reveals Himself to Moses in the book of Exodus, says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy. Now, it does conclude with also punishing the wicked. Well, read the Psalms. They're filled with God's love. Whereas in the New Testament, of all the biblical figures, Jesus talks most about hell. 
where the fire is not quenched. Or read the book of the book of Revelation. Revelation uh, chapter uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, fourteen. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's how the Bible depicts God's final judgment. Outside of God's mercy, outside of the city, quote unquote, Blood rises to the, the height of a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia, which is about equivalent to 183 modern miles. That's a lot of hammers and tent pegs. Oh, there is still God's judgment. How then, given that we are called as Christians to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, are we to do so? The answer is it's His judgment. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 12, it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. How? Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. See, if you're worried about all those fundamentalists who are getting too excited and too committed to Christianity, or, you might like to think not the level of their passion or the orthodoxy of their commitment, but to what kind of God they actually believe in. You can't be too extreme for believing in, 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 in Jesus' teaching that we should love our enemies. You can't believe that too much. And amazingly, according to the Apostle Paul, those who are able to live at peace with, with others and not take revenge are those who believe in the justice of God because they know that He will, just, will judge justly. And we leave it in His hands. Whereas someone who doesn't believe in the just judgment of God might well be tempted to take justice into their own hands. No wonder we live in such an unforgiving society today. Everyone is trying to be judge. So what do we learn from this passage? Well, as we've already seen, Man, men, be a Christian man, be a godly man, be a leader. So this time that you are here, women, pray, encourage, be all that God wants you to be. Be encouraged that God uses women for great things. Be a godly woman. Don't undermine the men around you, but encourage them. Point them in the right direction, if need be, like a Deborah, and be celebrated as a mother in Israel, as a woman of God. Non-Christian, don't think you can be good enough for God. He is holy. There is none that can escape the coming wrath. I have a solution for violence for you. He was beaten. 
nails were driven not through his temple, but through his hands. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shearers. He was silent, he bled and died for you. The cross does not legitimate violence, it overcomes it. Like a cosmic magnet pulling into himself, every evil black darkness in the universe. He became a black hole that you might have light. Ian McKellen, who uh, was famous for playing Gandalf in the movie series Lord of the Rings also of course acted in many other plays and movies and one uh, play he acted in is the Shakespeare play King Lear and when he was on tour with that play King Lear he was asked what he thought was the most significant moment of the play and he said the most significant line of the play is when the king looks up to the skies and says what source is there in heaven for such cruel heart? But of course, the answer is it's not in heaven, it's in us. And however well polished we are on the outside, inside, we know what kind of wicked people we are. We know what we would do if we could get away with it. And Jesus bears all that pain and sin, crying that you might not, weeping that you might dance. Taking all your sin and giving you all His righteousness. It's hinted at in this passage actually, right at the end again of verse 31, you see how the, uh, the, uh, the Lord inspires uh, these authors, the author of, of Judges, to include this line that is picked up throughout the story of the Bible. Like the sun as he rises in his might. Well, Malachi picks that up and later and talks about the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And Luke, as he tells the story of Jesus' birth, uses the same image of the sun rising in his righteousness. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the crucified one, sacrificed for all the suffering of the world, and we need to bow the knee before him that we might be saved from the wrath that is to come. For as sure as morning follows night, that day will come. And we need to make sure that on that great, on that day, on that great and glorious day, the sun does not blind us, but shines on us in mercy. Either way, morning is coming, and no man nor woman can stop it. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you give us your word to wrestle with, even the hard parts. We thank you, Lord, that there are many different parts to the Bible, but they all, in the end, play one melody pointing to your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that even this part of the Bible does too. We pray, Lord, that uh, the men in this church would be men of valor, courage, 
and Christ-likeness. We pray, Lord, that the women would be godly women and would be all that you, God, want them to be. We pray, Lord, for those who do have this question about the violence that seems legitimated by extremist religion. We pray, Lord, that this morning you would open their hearts, their minds, to see Jesus hung dead for them, that they might live, they might experience his love. We thank you, Lord, that as Christians, you don't ask us to be simpletons, but we have a reliable faith and a sure foundation in your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name.